the Epistle of Paul to Philemon, known simply as Philemon, is one of the books of the Christian New Testament. It is a prison letter, co-authored by Paul the Apostle with Timothy, to Philemon, a leader in the Colossian Church. It deals with the themes of forgiveness and reconciliation. Paul does not identify himself as an apostle with authority, but as a prisoner of Jesus Christ, calling Timothy, our brother, and addressing Philemon as, fellow laborer, and brother, Onesimus, a slave that had departed from his master Philemon, was returning with this epistle wherein Paul asked Philemon to receive him as a, brother beloved, quote, Philemon was a wealthy Christian, possibly a bishop of the house church that met in his home. Philemon chapter 1, 1, 2, in Coloss. This letter is now generally regarded as one of the undisputed works of Paul. It is the shortest of Paul's extant letters, consisting of only 335 words in the Greek text. Composition Authorship the epistle of Philemon is attributed to the Apostle Paul, and this attribution has rarely been questioned by scholars. The opening verse of the salutation also names Timothy alongside Paul. This, however, does not mean that Timothy was the epistle's co-author. Rather, Paul regularly mentions others in the address if they have a particular connection with the recipient. In this case, Timothy may have encountered Philemon while accompanying Paul in his work in Ephesus. Occasion According to the majority interpretation, Paul wrote this letter on behalf of Onesimus, a runaway slave who had wronged his owner Philemon. The details of the offense are unstated, although it is often assumed that Onesimus had fled after stealing money, as Paul states in verse 18 that if Onesimus owes anything, Philemon should charge this to Paul's account. Once Sima's status as a runaway slave was challenged by Alan White Callahan in an article published in the Harvard Theological Review and in a later commentary, Callahan argues that, beyond verse 16, nothing in the text conclusively indicates that Onesimus was ever the chattel of the letter's chief addressee. Moreover, the expectations fostered by the traditional fugitive slave hypotheses go unrealized in the letter. Modern commentators, even those committed to the prevailing interpretation, have tacitly admitted as much. Quote, All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother, and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, a doom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate, and comfort your hearts. 9 With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Recipient The letter is addressed to Philemon, who is described as a fellow worker of Paul. It is generally assumed that Philemon lived in Colossae. In the letter to the Colossians, Onesimus, the slave who fled from Philemon, and Archippus, whom Paul greets in the letter to Philemon, are described as members of the church there. The American John Knox proposed that one Sema's owner was in fact Archippus, and the letter was addressed to him rather than Philemon. In this reconstruction, Philemon would receive the letter first and then encourage Archippus to release Onesimus so that he could work alongside Paul. This view, however, has not found widespread support. Content Greeting and Introduction The opening salutation follows a typical pattern found in other Pauline letters. Paul first introduces himself, with a self-designation as a prisoner of Jesus Christ, which in this case refers to a physical imprisonment. He also mentions his associate Timothy, as a valued colleague who was presumably known to the recipient, as well as addressing the letter to Philemon. Paul sends greetings to Aphia, Archippus and the church that meets in Philemon's house. Aphia is often presumed to be Philemon's wife and Archippus, a fellow laborer, is sometimes suggested to be their son. Paul concludes his salutation with a prayerful wish for grace and peace. Thanksgiving and Intercession 
before addressing the main topic of the letter. Paul continues with a paragraph of thanksgiving and intercession. This serves to prepare the ground for Paul's central request. He gives thanks to God for Philemon's love and faith and prays for his faith to be effective. He concludes this paragraph by describing the joy and comfort he has received from knowing how Philemon has shown love towards the Christians in Colossae. Paul's Plea for Onesimus As a background to his specific plea for Onesimus, Paul clarifies his intentions and circumstances. Although he has the boldness to command Philemon to do what would be right in the circumstances, he prefers to base his appeal on his knowledge of Philemon's love and generosity. He also describes the affection he has for Onesimus and the transformation that has taken place with Onesimus's conversion to the Christian faith. Where Onesimus was, useless. Now he is, useful. Question mark. A word play. As Onesimus means, useful. Paul indicates that he would have been glad to keep Onesimus with him but recognized that it was right to send him back. Paul's specific request is for Philemon to welcome Onesimus as he would welcome Paul, namely as a Christian brother. He offers to pay for any debt created by Onesimus' departure and expresses his desire that Philemon might refresh his heart in Christ. Conclusion and Greetings In the final section of the letter, Paul describes his confidence that Philemon would do even more than he had requested, perhaps indicating his desire for Onesimus to return to work alongside him. He also mentions his wish to visit and asks Philemon to prepare a guest room. Paul sends greetings from five of his co-workers and concludes the letter with a benediction. Themes Paul uses slavery versus freedom language often in his writings as a metaphor. Although it is a main theme, Paul does not label slavery as negative or positive. Some scholars see it as unthinkable in the times to even question ending slavery, because slavery was so ingrained into society that the abolitionist would have been at the same time an insurrectionist, and the political effects of such a movement would have been unthinkable. This is a part of Pauline Christianity and theology. When it comes to Onesimus and his circumstance as a slave, Paul felt that Onesimus should return to Philemon but not as a slave, but under a bond of familial love. Paul also was not suggesting that Onesimus be punished, but Roman law allowed the owner of a runaway slave nearly unlimited privileges of punishment, even execution verses 13 to 14 suggest that Paul wants Philemon to send Onesimus back to Paul, possibly freeing him for the purpose. Marshall, Travis and Paul write, Paul hoped that it might be possible for significance. Paul's tactful address to Philemon was labeled holy flattery by Martin Luther. He saw a parallel between Paul and Christ in their work of reconciliation which is also contained within the concept of Christian grace. Still, Luther insisted that the letter upheld the social status quo. Though not explicit, the text could be interpreted to indicate that Paul did nothing to change Juan Simus's legal position as a servant and that Paul was complying with Roman law in returning him to Philemon. However, the text could. Sarah Rudin, in her Paul Among the People, argues that in the letter to Philemon, Paul created the Western conception of the individual human being, unconditionally precious to God and therefore entitled to the consideration of other human beings. Before Paul, Rudin argues, a slave was considered subhuman, and entitled to no more consideration than an animal. Dyer made McCullough, in his A History of Christianity, described the epistle as a Christian foundation document in the justification of slavery. For understanding the Philemon's book, it is necessary to know the situation of the early Christian community in the Roman Empire and the economic system of the classical antiquity based on the slavery. According to the epistle to Diognetus, for the Christians are distinguished from other men neither by country, nor language, nor the customs, which they observe. They are in the flesh. 
but they do not live after the flesh. They pass their days on earth, but they are citizens of heaven. They obey the prescribed laws, and at the same time surpass the laws by their lives. Those who, as far as their civil status is concerned, stand in relation to one another as masters and slaves. Inasmuch as they are members of the one church have become brothers and sisters. This is how Christians addressed one another. Even if external structures remained unaltered, this changed society from within. When the letter to the Hebrews says that Christians here on earth do not have a permanent homeland, but seek one which lies in the future, this does not mean for one moment that they live only for the future. Present society is recognized by Christians as an exile. They belong to a new society, which is the goal of their common pilgrimage and which is anticipated. In the course of that pilgrimage, 